he was possessed while he was driving. And he wasn't doing anything with the, the car, but he was like, he's like, he's like, your father's not here. You're misbehaving is making him. And I was like, what the heck? And I was like, dad, stop it. And he'd be like, what are you talking about? What? Today's episode is brought to you by Promescent. Use the code in our description to automatically get 15% off at checkout. What if there was just one? One supplement that helped you here, here, and yes, even here. Say hello to Vitaflux Powder for Men. This natural blend has three key amino acids like L-arginine, L-citrulline, and L-carnitine. With just a scoop in the morning and one scoop in the evening, Vitaflux helps to increase testosterone levels, improve recovery times from injury and exhaustion, and increase libido, giving you energy in any activity you engage in. Did we mention it comes with delicious flavors like mint mojito? So what are you waiting for? Get back to your prime. Shop Vitaflux Powder for Men today. You're watching ASN Underground with Sam Mack. That's me. I am constantly inspired by people who wake up every single morning <sighs> stricken with the chronic illness known as I can do that disease. People who think I can do that are absolutely unstoppable. One day they're sitting in a cafe, sipping on a latte, chewing on a baguette, thinking France would be nice to visit. A month later, they're speaking fluent French. These people don't necessarily believe that they can do anything. They just believe there's no proper reason why they cannot. And it's not everything that they go after, just things that interest them. One of my dear friends has managed to master everything that has entertained his mind. From feature films, to music albums, to children's book, this guy can do it all. But we wanna know how you become that guy. Before he was a guy, he was a boy. And when he was a boy, he had a father and that father raised him into the man he is today. And we're gonna have him lie down on our couch and tell us about his childhood. Ladies and gentlemen, this is James Cullen Brissac. 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 <laughs> it's okay. I don't even know my last name either. Okay. <laughs> to be fair. To be fair. Uh, on all your social medias, you are James Cullen B. Exactly. And no one actually says your last name. Well, that's because I like people messing up my last name. It's like kind of part of my thing. Because then I got to be like, yo, my last name is actually Bressack. You just like people feeling like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just like, I'm just, I honestly, like, I just respond to any last name at this point. So James and I go way back. We do all sorts of crazy events and things together. I've gotten to know your life quite intimately. That sounds strange. Uh, <laughs> we know each other really well. We are really, really good friends. But uh, this man before you right now would not be the man he is if it wasn't for the man that raised him. And we're here to talk about your childhood. So Awesome. I had like a pretty semi-normal upbringing, I think. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I grew up, uh, you know, pretty much playing like sports. I, I did like wrestling and baseball and all that stuff. My dad was my baseball coach. And then, uh, you know, like uh, around when I was like 12, you know, my dad got really sick. And, uh, and you know, maybe it was a little earlier than that. Maybe it was like 10, but he got really sick. And uh, all we could do was like watch movies together. And so like that became like our thing. Like, you know, he couldn't, he was like bedridden. So like we would just watch movies and like, that's kind of like what we would do is that was our thing. We watch movies, talk about it. And, uh, and that's when I really like fell in love with film. And I remember one of the times like he was able to like get out of bed, he took me to go see Kill Bill in theaters. And, uh, and I remember like the ticket taker was like, are you sure you want to take your son to see this? Like, it's like, it's violent. It's like really like there's so many curse words and stuff. And my dad's like, yeah, that's why I'm taking him to see it. And so I remember like sitting in that theater, like feeling like I was going to get like kicked out. Like I had like won the lottery. It was at like the Grove. And, and like, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, and, and it was like, it was like this dangerous, awesome experience. And, and from there I was like, I, I know I need to make movies. Uh, I mean, you know, earlier on too, 
you know, we always watched movies when I was a kid. My dad would pause the movie like very young, you know, like when I was like five and he'd ask me questions about the movie, uh, you know, like why the camera's moving a certain way, why things looked a certain way, why the actor was doing stuff. And I thought it was just to make sure if I was paying attention, but the older I got, I realized, oh, he was kind of like, you know, teaching me the behind the scenes of, of making a film. And, uh, so a lot of that was really, you know, kind of what shaped me. But I was, I mean, I was the kid in like, you know, high school, I'd get a book report and I'd make a short film about why I didn't feel like doing the book report. And I'd turn that in instead. And they'd be like, did you even read the book? And I'd be like, no. Uh, and I remember my, uh, my parents uh, were going, uh, like they had gotten divorced. And, uh, and I, I remember it was like, I was in 10th grade. And they got called into the principal's office. And so they were both there. It was the first time I'd ever seen them in the same room in years since they had like gotten divorced. And so I knew it was like super important, like super serious. Uh, and so it's them and like my chemistry teacher. And, and like, they're like, you know, uh, he's going to fail out of chemistry. And my mom's like, oh my God. And she starts crying and stuff. And, and, and they're like, you know, what do you have to say for yourself? My dad was pretty pissed too. And I was like, don't worry. I'm, I'm not going to need chemistry when I'm making movies. And, and everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, Were you right? Uh, I, you know what? I have not needed chemistry at all, but uh, I'll let you know if it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of making movies, what kind of movies have you made that our audience might be familiar with? You know, I've made a lot of different movies. Um, you know, I, it's, it's weird. So I'm 31 years old. I have, yeah, produced, baby. I have produced almost 100 movies at this point. And I have directed 22 feature films. Uh, and I've kind of run the gamut of genres. Like, you know, uh, when I started off at 18 years old, my first film was a $7,000 budget straight out of high school because I was like, Robert Rodriguez only needs seven grand. That's all I need. Uh, and so I made that. And it's a horror movie. It's terrible. It's unwatchable. Nobody should see it. Uh, but I learned everything from that one. And from there, I've built and grown. But like early on in my career, everybody's like, oh, he's just a horror guy. And then so like I went and I did, you know, a couple dramas and I did an animated kids musical and I did all these different movies to like get away from being horror. And then I settled into action. And that's what I've been doing for the past, uh, you know, four years is I've, four or five years I've been making action movies. So, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, Steven Seagal. I worked with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Never I worked with uh, Bruce Willis, Mel Gibson. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been a really awesome experience because, you know, growing up watching movies, I didn't go to film school. So like, you know, there's a lot of times where I'm making a movie and I'm, you know, looking at the monitor and I'm like, holy shit, that's Mel Gibson. Or like, holy shit, that's Van Damme. Like, and, and, and it's like blowing my mind because it's like, these are the people I grew up watching. Yeah. And I get to see them on my movie. I'm like, I'm sitting at the monitor. And I'm like, this looks like a movie I'd watch. And like, that's, that's been really exciting for me. This is wild. So right now we can find you on Netflix. We can find you on Amazon. We can find I mean, you it changed, on... The funny thing is, is they all change. Yeah. So they're on something. You know, they're, they're everywhere. But I can't... By the time this comes out, unless it comes out tomorrow, it could... Everything could be on different thingies because like every few months they change where they are. Can we can we title drop any of them? Sure. Yeah. I did a movie called Survive the Game starring uh, Bruce Willis, uh, Fortress starring Bruce Willis, Hot Seat starring Mel Gibson. Um, I did uh, Beyond the Law starring Steven Seagal and DMX. We can't um, name drop the next one until November. Have, no, right? no. Darkness of Man oh. starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, which is not out yet, and but it'll be out soon. Truck. And starring your truck. Your truck makes a very good spin in the air, corkscrew, and, and completely blows up. Uh, that was fun. Um, and then uh, you're also in it. There's that too. You're, <laughs> I like how you're more excited <laughs> about your truck than you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, yeah. And then we got Murder Anyone, which just came out now, which is available everywhere. And Murder Anyone, which is the movie we are here to talk about uh, was originally designed to be a stage play? Yes. Yeah, so my dad was a writer. Um, oh, what did he happen to write? So my dad was the head writer of Pinky and the Brain, Animaniacs, Tiny Toons, uh, many, many cartoons like Darkwing Duck, The Smurfs. Uh, he won three Emmys and a WGA award. Uh, and he made a play called Murder Anyone, which was actually inspired by uh, the fact that, you know, later on in his life, you know, uh, instead of writing movies and, and TV shows, he just started writing plays and then was like 
spending his money putting these plays on in Los Angeles. I'm like, Dad, what what are you doing? You know, wasting your money doing this like with plays. Like, uh, you know, why aren't you just making like a small movie or something? And he's he's like, you know, like no, I'm making plays. And like, I was like, that's that's ridiculous. So the whole movie is about two writers arguing about whether or not they should make a play or a movie, uh, while writing this who done it. And so, like, it was heavily inspired by mine and my dad's argument. And so when I saw the play, I was like, Dad, this was great, but you should have made it a movie. And, and he was like, you know, I made the movie. You can make the I, – I mean, I, I made the play. You can make the movie. And I was like, you know, oh, yeah, whatever. And then, you know, uh, it was the last creative endeavor he actually did before he passed away. And so me and him, uh, you know, one of the last things he asked me to do was to make sure that his uh, – his scripts didn't like live on his hard drive. Yeah. Uh, and you know, he has many, many scripts. So I, I went through his hard drive. It took, you know, a long time I and mean, he passed away a couple of years ago and it took about a year and a half before I could actually push myself to look at his computer and go through the hard drive. But, um, uh, this one called to me is like the first one that I would do. So I completely a hundred percent self-financed. I didn't raise outside money. I paid for it out of my own pocket and, uh, and I made uh, this movie uh, for an audience of one. I made the movie the best way I thought he would have enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, the two writers who are the leads in it, um, Maurice LaMarche and, uh, and Charlie Howell. Charlie Howell was my father's writing partner of 25 years. Um, uh, Maurice LaMarche was the voice of the brain from Pinky and the Brain. and was also my dad's best friend. And, uh, and I just made a, this fun movie with a bunch of friends just to – see what would happen. And right now it's 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, so uh, people seem to enjoy it or they're just being nice. Um, but either way, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty great to have made this, uh, this fun, kooky, weird movie. I was at the, what was it, like the secret L.A. pre-premiere screening? Yeah, it's like a small secret thing where I was just like trying to see it with friends before Yeah, you couldn't even out. sit in the theater seats like without your knees hitting the next set of seats. Like it was this real tight, quiet, like yeah. hidden theater. Um, and Maurice was there with his wife and hearing, um, well, first of all, hearing the voice of the cartoons of my childhood yeah. blew my mind. Like I didn't know <laughs> that I was going to fangirl over a sound. <laughs> um, it was amazing. Yeah. Uh, Maurice stole my heart because he pulls those voices out back and forth so fast. Yeah. He's, um, he's, I mean, Maurice is a sweetheart. I've known him since I was like, you know, knee high. And, uh, and, and it's hilarious because, you know, whenever I'm, I'm, I'm talking with him, uh, I kind of do the thing where I'll be like, do that voice. No, do that voice. No, respond to that. Like, you know, it is like, uh, he's not like a, you know, <laughs> it's it's unfair to demand those, but it, he still does it because when I was a kid, I used to always be like, yeah. yeah, do this funny voice. And he would because, you know, he can he's the man of a thousand voices. But you grew up with the the brains and the voice of our generational childhood in your house. Yeah, like, it's it was it was it was it was a lot of fun. It was it was like a living cartoon. Uh, a lot of things were not taken very seriously. <laughs> Um, I'll tell Acme you that. hammers came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. My dad was uh, was uh, it was literally a living cartoon character. Um, I remember one time. Maybe this is why I made horror movies. But I remember one time when I was a kid uh, and <laughs> like I was misbehaving in the car, and instead of like yelling at me, my dad just pretended that he was possessed while he was driving. <laughs> he wasn't doing anything with the <laughs> car, but but he was like he was like he pretended like he's like he would he like talked in like a demonic voice, and he was like he's like he's like your father's not here. Your misbehaving is making him. And I was like, what the heck? I was like, you know, and then, and then I was like, Dad, stop it! And he'd be like, what are you talking? about what uh what's what's going on and then no, he'd be like parents. and then he'd be like he'd be like he doesn't know that i'm possessed i'm like what the hell this is like after my dad would show me movies i wasn't supposed to see yeah of course and so like you know at like eight years old he showed me like the exorcist and then like a week later was doing that to like mess with me he was he was he was a character solid parenting <laughs> uh act like you're possessed to give your child that core memory he was driving serve. completely fine it was just like the, the safety voice. first yeah yeah safety first yeah psychologically damaged safe. second yes yeah, sa <laughs> psychologically it's completely fine i mean it turned out all right the one thing i do love about <laughs> <laughs> i was like it turned out all, all right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nobody wear pink around him yeah um the one thing I do love about uh, Maurice and the other uh, actors and people involved in Murder Anyone at that private screen we went to was hearing them speak so genuinely about 
this man that to many of us watching is just the creator of our childhood daydreams. Um, hearing people like bring life to this person that you, I mean, you grew up with, um, that we all love and honor and respect because he was able to give us those cartoons of our childhood. But it, it really became a tear jerking moment when you started talking about your dad's legacy and why this is important for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, just just to clarify, he didn't create him. Tom Ruger did, but he was the head writer, so he was writing all the jokes and stuff like that. You we know, all know who effort. the brains behind <laughs> the operation but, is. But uh, <laughs> you know, it you know it, it was important to to you know the fact that when my dad passed away, all he wanted me to do was was look at you know his hard drive and make sure I didn't let his scripts die with him and his stories die with him. Mm -hmm. and, and it really like as a storyteller, uh, you know, a person that makes movies, it, 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 it really is this powerful thing because, you know, what we leave behind is the stories we tell, you know, before what, when I'm, when I'm dead and gone, my movies, you know, unless the world completely erupts, but like, you know, my movies will last forever, you know? And, and so the stories we leave behind, are, are important for future generations. And, and, you know, the legacy of, of carrying that on and carrying on that torch for him, not only, um, carrying on his words, but also, you know, in myself, the, the lessons that he taught me, I am an extension of him. And so being able to, you know, push that forward and carry that torch was important to me. Um, do you think that growing up when he was having and creating these core memories with you, he was doing it on purpose to teach you and guide you uh, as an adult, or was he just you know being a man? I like to think it was uh, it well was, thought out. I, I, I like to think it was well thought out. But anybody who knew my dad, he was pure chaos of ridiculousness. So who knows? <laughs> pure chaos of ridiculousness. I want that on my business card. Yes, he was. Uh, he was pure chaos of ridiculousness. So who knows? Oh. Who knows? But uh, it was. Uh, I think uh, you know. All I know is that sometimes, you know, we, we shape the people around us, even, even with the smallest things that we do. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I remember one thing that really resonated with me is when I was like four years old, he took me to one of the recordings of his uh, TV show, um, uh, Captain Simeon, the space monkeys, which was like this, you know, animated show in the nineties. And, uh, and, I like David Warner, who was playing one of the characters across Malcolm McDowell. And I, I went up to David Warner and, and like said something to him about how he should perform the role because I had like come up with the character because there was the character Malcolm McDowell played was called Rhesus uh, two. And so I was like, dad, you should do something with a Rhesus one. So he wrote a whole episode about it. So that's why he brought me. And, uh, and I said something to, uh, David Warner and David Warner went to go talk to my dad. My dad came up to me and was like, you're going to be a director kid. And that's uh, that really kind of, you know, stayed with me my whole life. And now you are a director. We talk about you writing children's book and making music and all these other things. You have you wake up every morning with uh, your cup overflowing with audacity. Like you you just take on whatever amuses you for the day. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I like to be creative and I like to st stay busy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, making stuff is 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 important to me and. And really just, you know, leaving behind, you know, different fun, creative things. We live in a world of so much chaos that like, you know, finding, a, you know, a true art is escapism. And so finding like, you know, these escapes into fun, different worlds uh, is, is exciting. Well, speaking of escapism, let's throw on your trailer so we can talk about yeah. what happened in this movie. Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> no matter how secure you are. How safe you feel, danger could be right at your shoulder. Are you going to write any of this? I wrote plenty. Plenty? You wrote Act One. Okay, okay. Richard enters. He's a pleasant-looking chap with a perpetual grin. He's dressed in tennis clothes. Murder? Anyone? Isn't it a little early in the play to show that Richard's a psycho killer? Well, it does take a bit of the pressure off, doesn't it? <laughs> Wait a second, what is that? Someone in a chicken costume. Why is it someone in a chicken costume? This is where we reveal that something is going on that the audience didn't realize. 
there's something going on that I didn't realize. You'd like to murder me, Blaine? We can't have a psychic. I am Mary Clemens. I am blind. And been summoned. By whom? The dead. <laughs> this play could be our meal ticket. Ha-cha-cha! This is the final straw. Murder? Anyone? Kung Fu zombies and Marilyn Monroe, and now a vampire? You say that like it's a bad thing. I forgot about the, the seance, and I forgot about the stunt doubles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, there is so much in this movie that is hilarious yeah it's i mean the movie completely goes off the rails it was written by your father yes. obviously this is this is this is my dad going full crazy uh i mean the movie just goes off the rails from beginning to end it gets progressively more and more ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, intentionally um and it was a lot of fun to make because it goes through like 10 different genres of film while we're making it because they can't really decide what movie or play they're making and as it's coming together, it starts to, you know, as you see, like it starts on the stage, then it becomes more and more realized the world that they're in uh, because it becomes more and more film-like. Um, but it's also, you know, uh, truly about the internal struggle that artists have about like, you know, art versus commerce, because mm -hmm. like, you know, do we stay true to ourselves or do we give like the mass, the masses, what we think the masses want. Right. And, uh, and it's a battle that I think all artists have. And obviously, you know, it was my dad making a statement on that when he was making the film, uh, the, the script. And I thought that was a really interesting thing because, you know, although he chose to make it as a play, I, you could tell the struggle he was having of maybe I should make this as a movie. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's the interesting thing that we have as artists is everybody is trying to find their place in the world with their art and how true to themselves that they should stay. You did such a phenomenal job making this film. Um, it's such a beautiful, beautiful, loving tribute to your father. Um, but it is a damn funny movie. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, he's, you know, I was, I was gifted really, really funny words. So it was, uh, it was easy to make funny with uh, such talented uh, actors and, and such a great script. And I tried to, you know, make the movie in a way that it still kind of felt like a play. So I like honored the way he did it because it was weird because I was directing it, but I also saw the one he directed and so like, it was almost like there was two directors making the movie because like I wanted to honor what I know he wanted and did. So without going too far off of that. I love this. I love this so much. Now, um, I, a little birdie told me that you have a cameo in your own movie. Well, you've seen the movie, so That's little, little birdie, birdie is your own me. eyes. <laughs> I'm the bird. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, there's a mid credit scene that everybody should stick around for. It if is really lovely. Now, was there ever a point where you might have been um, replaced as yourself on this film? <laughs> yes. No, there was a point where uh, I almost recast myself. Um, for your own cameo. For my own cameo, because I have a monologue that I messed up 30 times. Wow. Uh, the first time I walked in and I was, the, the actor said his line and I'm supposed to respond. And I was just staring at him. And I was like, oh, yeah, right. I'm supposed to talk. Because <laughs> so I was so used to looking there. at the monitor, you know, I'm like hiding behind the monitor. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's me. I'm supposed to say things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you had um, a really loving cast um, of people who knew you, well, know you, knew your father um, and really respected the project. And I think that really shows in the final product of this. Also, us being able to meet the cast and talk with them at your screening just seeing how much like love and respect was put on your name. Yeah, um, it, it was, was really beautiful. It was really great to give them rehearsed lines to say to people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, you here are the nice things door. you're going to say about me to people. You know, they're actors, so they can make it seem real. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. We were we were blessed with uh, with such a wonderful team. Uh, you know, it was such a fun environment. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, you're making something fun because everybody's having fun on set. I mean, you know, everybody has asked me like, you know, Hey, this must've been such a hard process because you're making something to honor your dad. And like, you know, that must've been like really emotional. And I was like, I don't know, we were on set, we were all cracking jokes, having the best time, you know, and, and just being silly. And, and honestly, that's what my dad would have wanted. 
You know, he's he's definitely not the type that would have uh, wanted people to be like wallowing in misery. So tell me about while you're filming this movie, what was something that you think your dad would have loved? Like a funny moment, something unexpected happened, something went horribly wrong, but it was horribly hilarious. Um, you know, I think my dad would have found it really, really funny um, just uh, seeing the guy, seeing Spencer in the chicken suit. Um because we were film we were filming this during you know uh, a, a very hot part of the year. Wait, is that our Spencer? Yes, that's Spencer Breslin from the other. Yeah, you didn't know that's the no! same. Spencer? Oh yeah, it's, yeah, it's Spencer. Oh damn. Okay. Yeah, Spencer also has a great role in uh, in the Van Damme movie. But yeah, my my dad would we'll be back in funny. November for that film. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my dad would have found that really funny. Oh man, that... because it was like swelteringly hot. And he's in this thick chicken suit. <laughs> oh. I am I am enamored with this film. I've never thought you did on it. Um, can you tell us anything hilarious from set? As a director, it could be any this film or any other ones that you've done, um, where something just went bogusly wrong. You know, um, it's, it's weird because the things that I find funny might not be what other people find funny. Um, but... Uh, I'm trying to find like what's an appropriate story I can tell without getting anyone in without, trouble. No, without name dropping anybody. Yeah. Um, I think like one of the funniest. So when I did I had my movie in Thailand, um, uh, Pernicious, uh, there's a scene where the uh, the car is the the taxi cab is supposed to drive up to this big house that they're all staying in. Um, and, uh, and I get a call from the producers like really early in the morning and they're like, uh, yeah, so we can't film the scene of the car pulling up, uh, to the house. And I was like, why? And we were filming during monsoon season and they're like, well, the whole yard is flooded. And I was like, what? And so like we, we went to go see it and, uh, and literally the entire yard was so flooded. It just looked like a river. And I was like, I was like, just build a boat dock and, and put a boat on it. And so if you see the movie, they come up to the house on a boat. And, 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 <laughs> because and, Thailand was flooded. Because Thailand was <laughs> flooded. And, uh, and hilariously, like that was literally just their front lawn. Uh, there was no river or anything, but it looks like this epic, like river, like this house on the water made the movie like so much cooler. People were like, how did you find a location like that? And I was like, we didn't, it, it was flooded. <laughs> So the moral of the story, children, is screw chemistry, follow your dreams, and you too can just say, well, build me a boat dock and bring a boat to the house. <laughs> and you could be living the dream, dressing in outlandish tracksuits. No, but I, 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 yes, I always wear outlandish tracksuits. But uh, I would say this, like anybody who wants to go out and make movies, the only thing that's stopping you is yourself. You know, most people have a phone and, uh, and if you have a phone in your pocket, it means you have a camera. So if you have that, I get your friends together, pull out the phone, shoot a movie, make something. And then from there, just try and do it bigger and better. I mean, you know, for me in the beginning, you know, uh, when Sam was introducing me, she was saying that, you know, I, I, I believe I can do anything. I don't necessarily believe I can do anything. I just am not afraid of failing uh, because I know if I fail once, the next time I'm just going to fail a little bit better. And so that's, uh, that's kind of been my motto. And uh, so just don't be afraid of failing. Go out there and do it. Be a failure. You heard it here first. James, where can people find you online? Where can they find this movie specifically and watch it? <laughs> um, you can watch Murder Anyone. Anywhere that you rent a movie. So uh, wherever you rent your movies, watch it there. Um, murder, comma, anyone. And listen, if you rent movies at Blockbuster, you cannot get it there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anywhere you rent them online. <laughs> and then uh, you can follow me on social media at James Cullen B. Because no one knows what his last name is. Bressack. B stands for because no one knows how to pronounce my last name. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and thank you so much for having me on the show, Sam. It's exciting to see you doing this. This is awesome. So you've got 40 seconds left. Do you want to leave us with a dance? I do not. <laughs> Damn I it. I don't think of this one person to do that so far. I do not. <laughs> Jared will do it. Jared will do it. I Her guarantee you Jared will do a dance. <laughs> I guarantee it. Um, so now we're just going to stretch this for 25 seconds. Yeah, it's going to be 25 seconds of us just awkwardly. Just, yeah. Talking. I have We should never... do like the kind of like the, 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 the like, you know, slow motion like... <laughs> You know, like the, and then like the credits are rolling. That'd be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More credits. Yeah. <laughs>
Speaking of first, am I getting a credit? We only need eight more seconds. Uh, I don't know if I can answer that. This like five, four. I mean, uh, three, can two. I get car um, okay, bye, guys. <laughs>